You're listening to another episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. Uh, In part one of last week's episode, one of the most dangerous men in American politics, we took a deep dive into the career of David Brooks, mostly during the weekly standard phase of his career. We didn't go all the way back to Brooks's days at the Wall Street Journal or five minutes he spent at the Chicago News Bureau, where he visited one of Chicago's high-rise slums once or maybe twice and decided that the entire liberal project has been an unmitigated disaster. Because that level of scholarship is best left to people like Rick Perlstein. Instead, in keeping with the mission of this podcast, we want to explain and contextualize the deep, toxic influence David Brooks and his many imitators have had on American politics. You may remember from part one of this story how David Brooks made a speedy and incredibly awkward transition from his liberals are terrorist loving idiots weekly standard persona to his both sides are equally bad and a GOP renaissance is just around the corner, which was his New York Times persona. And here is a brief David Brooks timeline for those of you keeping track at home. David Brooks in 1999 believed the Republican Party was awesome and lefties are idiots. David Brooks in 2000, the Republican Party is awesome and the lefties are cranks. David Brooks 2001, George Bush is a fucking awesome gargantuan tax cutting genius and those tax cuts are easily affordable and the lefties are crazy for saying otherwise. And David may I Bro- just inter- interrupt for a moment? Was that the year that he said, why aren't we doing more tax cuts? Oh, yes. They should be bigger. They should be bigger. Yeah. And, and they're easily affordable and we can pay for everything. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. The economy is is in a perpetual state of, of growth and expansion. We can pay for all this shit. And anybody who says otherwise is stupid and crazy. Then, of course, 2001 was the year of 9-11. So David Brooks in 2002 was of the opinion that George Bush was a military and economic genius and the anti-war liberals are vicious crackpots who hate America. David Brooks in 2003 announced that the Iraq war was over and Bush had won. Suck it, liberal haters. And David Brooks in 2004, okay, the Iraq war is maybe not entirely over, but it's going great. So suck it, liberal morons. Republicans rule. And then in 2005, David Brooks says the Republicans have hit a little bump here. But really, it's all Tom DeLay's fault. And once they chase him out, they'll get back to being 100% awesome. And also, Harry Reid is a lying, tantrum-throwing baby, which he really did right. Uh, 2005 also marks the addition of isms to David Brooks' writing. From this point on, none of the Republican Party's many atrocities and failures will be the fault of Republicanism or conservatism. Because, to quote from the inimitable Digby, conservatism cannot fail conservatism can only be failed. And so from now on, any monstrous stuff the right does will be the fault of delayism or Bushism or Limbaughism or finally, you guessed it, Trumpism. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. (laughs) You you can see the train wreck coming. This is David Brooks from 2006. First, Republicans need to hold new leadership elections. As Newt Gingrich and Vin Weber told me yesterday... Tom DeLay needs to take care of his own legal problems and give up the dream of returning as majority leader. Yes, in 2006, David Brooks was really going to the disgraced, ousted, bomb-throwing Newt Gingrich for insider info on what the GOP needed to do to save itself. This is Mr. Brooks again. But Republicans need to do more than bump DeLay. They need to put the entire leadership team up for a revote because the real problem wasn't DeLay, it was DeLayism. Boom! Now, given Brooks's ubiquity and influence in 2006, the hard pivot between his old persona and his new persona 
really should have been big news. This was a, this should have been an, a, a revelation like unto the road to Damascus, but it wasn't. And the reason why it wasn't is the subject of this episode. So back to the timeline in the year 2006, which was the year when the Bush administration began to collapse. In November, the Democrats would trounce the Republicans in the midterms, and the smell of something very bad coming for the GOP hung in the air all year. The news from Iraq was ominous and getting worse. It was the year that George W. Bush went from praising Donald Rumsfeld as the greatest Secretary of Defense in history shortly before the election to firing Rummy one day after the election. This is from NBC News on November 8th, 2006. Rumsfeld stepping down. <laughs> Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld stepped down as Defense Secretary on Wednesday, one day after midterm elections in which opposition to the war in Iraq contributed to heavy Republican losses. Also, by 2006, the huge Clinton budget surplus that was going to last forever was nothing but a dim and distant memory. Instead, under unified Republican control of the government, the House, the Senate, and the White House, the United States now was running a $248 billion a year budget deficit with no end in sight. Just five years earlier, David Brooks had not only sworn this would never happen, but had used his position at the Weekly Standard to ridicule as crazy and stupid all the Democrats and economists who had warned that it would happen. Brooks has never apologized for or retracted any of his wildly wrong predictions or slanderous accusations which has always been par for the course for conservatives in media. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Denial, deflection, never admit you're wrong is, is a consistent conservative trait. So as I can a just brief, hear David Brooks saying, I don't think I ever wrote any of I, this. I, I, you know, I, I, we all make mistakes in our youth. I'm saved now. <laughs> Some bullshit. I don't know. That was a long time ago. No fair remembering the past. Um, but as a brief aside, since our business is remembering the past, some of you might remember that before Bill Clinton was elected, most Republicans shrugged off the huge deficits that Reagan and Bush the first had run up as no big deal. Then, when Bill Clinton was elected, deficits suddenly became the most important issue in the universe to Republicans. They effectively killed most of Clinton's domestic agenda and forced him instead to focus almost exclusively during his first term on paying down the debts they had run up. This now set the pattern of Republicans never giving a shit about deficits when they were in power. This now set the pattern of Republicans never giving a shit about deficits when they were in office, cutting taxes for the wealthy, and then suddenly caring only about deficits when Democrats came to power. And so, with it all starting to slip away, in 2006, we find David Brooks's aggressive transformation into the king of, oh my God, both sides are horrible, is now fully underway. This was the year when Brooks suddenly added a call for a third party to his lexicon, a call he would repeat about every six months or so from then on. As we briefly touched on in the last episode, the trauma that caused Brooks to throw an op-ed tantrum in the New York Times and call for a party number three was the defeat of his dear friend and fellow Iraq war cheerleader, Senator Holy Joe Lieberman, in the primaries by anti-war candidate Ned Lamont. This is from David Brooks in August of 2006. There are two major parties on the ballot, but there are three major parties in America. There's the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the McCain-Lieberman Party. All were on display Tuesday night. The Democratic Party was represented by its rising force, Ned Lamont, on a victory platform with the net roots exulting before him and Al Sharpton smiling just behind. Now, listen to Brooks' 2006 tirade about tribalism and polarization and all the rest, and you will hear the Rosetta Stone for all future third-party, third-way scams from no labels to the forward party built on the sanctification of the imaginary, sane, and sensible center. In Brooks's column, 
and in virtually all of his writing for the next 16 years, you can see the rules and vocabularies which will be found in every successful Beltway Pundit style book. Mr. Brooks continues, The McCain-Lieberman party begins with a rejection of the Sunni Shiite style of politics itself. It rejects those whose emotional attachment to their party is so all-consuming it becomes a form of tribalism and who believe the only way to get American voters to respond is through aggression and stridency. The flamers in the established parties tell themselves that their enemies are so vicious, they have to be vicious too. They rationalize their behavior by insisting that circumstances have forced them to shelve their integrity for the good of the country. They imagine, once they have achieved victory through pulverizing rhetoric, they will return to the moderate nuanced sensibilities they think they still possess. But the experience of delay and the net roots delays in the Democratic Party amply demonstrate the means determine the ends. Hyperpartisans may have started with subtle beliefs, but their beliefs led them to partisanship, and their partisanship led them to malice, and malice made them extremist, and pretty soon they were no longer the same people. The McCain-Lieberman party counters with constant reminders that the country comes before party, and that in politics a little passion energizes, but unmarshaled, but unmarshaled passion corrupts, and that more people want to vote for civility than venom. Now, the reason for the mention of the net roots delays in the Democratic Party was that while the entire Beltway mainstream media had rolled over for the Bush administration, the liberal blogosphere, especially sites like Daily Kos, were a real rising force in American politics and media. We were proudly anti-everything David Brooks stood for. We said fuck a lot. We saw the growing threat of the increasing derangement of the Republican Party base, and we wrote about it every day. We were building a media-savvy community that knew how to use the internet to get around the guardians of the established order. And as the Iraq war continued to spiral into complete disaster, it increasingly looked as if we were the only people who knew what the hell we were talking about. Also in his column, David Brooks misspells the word unmarshaled which I found hilarious. And it's there in case you need further proof that no one at the New York Times edits any of his stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, all of this scared the shit out of pundits like David Brooks, who looked like they were about to miss the last chopper leaving the wrong side of history. So here's an exchange among panelists on the long defunct Chris Matthews show, also from 2006. David Brooks. Whoever the Democratic candidate is, that is the weakness of the Democratic Party. They've got the blogs and the net roots who are semi-nuts and who insist on a Stalinist line of discipline. And then the panel laughs. David Brooks repeats, this is objectively true. Joe Klein, who I'm sure most of you don't know, steps in with, as opposed to the gun advocates, David Brooks. It's true for both parties. You've got Daily Kos on the left and you've got Pat Dobson on the right. And then Chris Matthews asks, which party has more nuts by your count? And David Brooks replies, objectively, the Democratic Party. In 2007, there was more both sides suck, but liberals suck worse. This was also the year Brooks pitched a genuinely hysterical, how dare anyone suggest that St. Ronald Reagan ever used racism to get elected, tantrum in the New York Times. In 2008, John McCain was definitely going to beat that upstart Obama from Illinois. He was a war hero after all. Then, after McCain got shellacked, millions of Republicans felt the urgent need to burn their Bush-Cheney bumper stickers and run away from all the disasters they had created. The party of personal responsibility wanted nothing to do with taking personal responsibility for the previous eight years which was how the Republican rebranding scheme called the Tea Party really took off. 2009 was the year that David Brooks discovered these newly minted independent voters who appeared out of nowhere. David Brooks said they were awesome and not one bit racist. In fact, they're just the jolt of reformist energy the GOP needs to get back to being 100% awesome. 
and boy howdy, David Brooks just could not get enough of them. In 2009, he wrote a long, treacly column praising these brave new arrivals to our plane of existence. And by making a tossed salad out of a grab bag of different poles and quote-unquote trends that were a scant seven months long, Brooks concluded that the country was now being driven by, quote, independence, unquote. And surprise, these independents had all made a massive lurch to the right. <laughs> we, we were all terribly shocked to learn this. Yes. This was just one of a nearly unbroken stretch of, quote, both sides do it, all hail the sacred center columns that Brooks has been writing ever since. And rather than bog you down with 100 hours of dissecting each one, let's switch gears for a moment to remember the mission of this podcast, which is history and context. Modern American political history is not just a series of dates and places and conservatives doing terrible things. It is a story in which an individual tragedy or realignment or lie can have both precedence and consequences. And it is our mission to do what the pundits and the political press refuse to do. Look back at the road that led us here and take stock of what happened along the way. So at this point in our story, what has happened and who has learned what lesson from it? What had happened was that, objectively, the left had been 100% right about the right all along. And with the net roots, the left now had a tool with which we could bypass the mainstream media and talk directly to each other and theoretically to the public. Objectively, this meant that not only had conservative pundits and the mainstream media been horribly wrong, they had been deeply complicit in selling the Bush administration's lethal lies to the public, particularly about the Iraq war. This meant that the GOP voters were faced with the humiliating reality that they had been dupes, that everyone they had trusted had lied to them over and over again, and that the worst people in the world, the dirty hippies, were the only ones who had not been fooled. And so, all of them, the mainstream media and the conservative commentariat, and the Republican base, they all had the same problem. What story can we tell? What fairy tale can we invent that will make all of this go away? That will wipe our slates clean and allow us to go on as before while pretending that none of this was our fault? And it turns out the answer is actually pretty easy. Just lie about it. After all, just pretending that prominent people never said what they said or did what they did had worked to bury the filth the GOP had gotten up to during the Clinton administration, filth that had delighted the base, and which the mainstream media had been only too happy to go along with, so why not just do the same thing all over again? Almost overnight, the GOP base suddenly just up and disappeared, gone like a fart in a warp engine, just as certain dirty hippies had predicted. And in their place, millions of those newly minted independents suddenly appeared. And this is where the base of the Republican Party learned the most important Republican lesson of all. If you just willfully forget hard enough, you can get away with anything. And as a postscript to that lesson, several years later, after the fake Tea Party scam had done its work, both David Brooks and Joe Scarborough finally got around to admitting that, yeah, they knew it was the same old racist, imbecile Republican base all along, and everyone had a big laugh about it. The other important lesson that both the mainstream media and respectable conservative pundits like David Brooks learned was just how universally applicable and useful and indestructible the both sides lie would prove to be. Now, the first step of the lie was to cordon off all the active but embarrassing power centers that were now the actual beating heart of the GOP. That would mean Fox News and Rush Limbaugh and all of his imitators on the thousands of radio stations across the country. All of the Gingrich clones that were now being elected at the House. All the Koch-funded think tanks and foundations. Breitbart and its imitators and on and on and on. And pretend that they were merely the fringe. You don't even need to bother paying attention to those kooks because they don't matter. They're just fringe nuts. Don't pay attention to them at all. Step two was to conjure up some liberal somewhere, imaginary or not, and denounce the extremes on both sides as the root of all political evils. And the final step was to conjure a sacred center 
out of thin air, where all reasonable and normal Americans were to be found, and which just so happened to look exactly like David Brooks's Republican policy bucket list if you filtered it through Paul Ryan's magical arithmetic. Sweeping budget cuts, grand bargains, please stop talking about race, market-based solutions, yada, 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 et cetera, et cetera. This lie had everything anyone could ever want. Republicans who had enabled the Bush administration no longer needed to fear being held responsible for anything they'd ever said or done because they had been born again as independents. The mainstream media could crank out endless pious columns asking for civility and comity and why can't we all meet in the sensible center while advancing the Republican agenda. And those of us who'd been right about the right all along, well, we were now one of the extremes on both sides. And who wants to listen to some liberal extremist yap about what happened during the before time? Oh, and let's not forget this all happened during the peak of the Great Recession, when the global economy collapsed, just as the United States was swearing in a new president, the first black president. And that's when the right completely snapped and the big lie of both sides do it was put to its most severe test. Which we will dive right into on the next episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff. Thanks for listening to this, the latest warm-up episode. We continue to get a lot of great feedback and suggestions about tweaks to the format. So keep your comments coming. Our plan is to do a couple more of these before the end of 2022. And then if we have enough Patreon donors to do these every week on Tuesdays, in addition to our regular Thursday show. Don't forget, we're looking for a total of 300 Patreons to make this podcast fly. We're about halfway there. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you for that. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions. Productions.